Hi there. In this video, I'm talking to Ben Gordon. Ben is a physical therapist at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. He's interested in the role of machine learning and sensors in pose estimation, natural language processing, and clinical decision support. Ben worked at a digital health company in the United States for two and a half years while he was busy with his undergraduate degree, where he was involved in both the product and clinical teams. He graduated with his physiotherapy degree in January 2021. In this video, Ben and I talk about the challenges of exploring the relatively open space of new ideas that are related but not tightly bound as part of the early stages of writing a paper together. I have to apologize up front for both the video and audio issues in this session. First of all, I couldn't get both video feeds to display, so we decided to go without. This means that there are long periods when Ben and I are talking and you can only see my desktop. I also didn't do a great job of recording Ben's audio, and after all the post-processing I needed to do, it's less than ideal. So I apologize for both of those problems. With that, here we go with Ben and I talking about what we think is a pretty novel way of using Obsidian to capture a collaborative process of thinking together. Okay, Ben, welcome. Um, thanks very much for uh, agreeing to do this. Um, I don't know, is this, is this something that you've ever done before? I don't think this is something I've ever done before, no, but, but thanks for having me. I'm <laughs> excited to talk about this. Cool. So uh, we met, um, I mean, how, how long ago was it now? It seems it's probably longer than it, than it actually was. Um, a couple of months ago, um, we met... Yeah, we were introduced by, uh, I guess, a, a mutual colleague who suggested that we might have some interesting ideas around AI in physiotherapy practice. And um, I think we, we started talking after a, a meeting or two and realized that there are a couple of things that we might want to put down on paper. Um, and I, d I don't know your, your thoughts, but my initial impression um, in those very early stages were that you know, we were kind of touching on the edges of something that seemed like it might be interesting to talk about in a in a kind of a formal paper, but I, I found it really difficult to um, to get those ideas down onto a a piece of paper, as it were, um, a, a Google Doc. Um, what were some of your initial um, kind of feelings or, or frustrations around trying to explore this idea that was quite new for both of us? I think. Uh, well, it was definitely new new for me. And uh, I just found that the tools that we were trying to use uh, weren't really facilitating the kind of exploration of this new idea that um, I, I felt like I needed, but um, I was really struggling with the tools that, that we had at our disposal. Uh, what are some of your thoughts um, in, in those early stages? That's a great question. Um, I, I felt the same way. It, it was just hard. There were so many different directions I think we wanted to go. We started getting some ideas down on paper, and it, it was difficult to focus on one thing because you could go so deep on an idea or um, a certain level of, of you know an evidence base or whatever, and it was very hard to kind of go down those rabbit holes and then you know come back to the main point. So it, there was kind of like a I felt that there was like a bottleneck. Um, and Google Docs is great, but it just felt like there was a big limitation. I don't know if you felt the same way. Yeah, um, I think for for me, I mean, you can see I'm I'm sharing the screen now, and one of the things that I try to do is to just write things down in a in a a, a list of bullet points, um, trying to develop an argument that is is logical and internally consistent. And one of the things that I was really struggling with is that as I was reading and as we were talking. And you can see the the comments on the right hand side there. You know, eventually those comments just got out of hand. They were no longer aligned with the text that they were associated with. So there was a lot of scrolling up and down to see, you know, wh where was this comment again, and what piece of text was it linked to? And the more I was reading, the more I was struggling to slot pieces of information into this very kind of rough structure. Um, and it, it just became very clear that. I think for me, what what I realized is that Google Docs and, and any other kind of paper-based format is forcing you to put down your thoughts um, in, a, in a very linear structure from left to right, top to bottom. And 
all these new ideas, um, I, you know, I was I was having these these ideas and and really struggling to find places to slot them in, um, and and so I started like a miscellaneous section at the end, and you know then you're just dumping ideas randomly almost, and um, again I realized very quickly that that wasn't particularly useful. Yeah, and just playing off that, I I, I think there's something to be to be said about this idea of emergence, right? Things that happen that you can't really expect. You, you see relationships between things and there's overlap and you don't predict, you can't predict uh, the ideas that can emerge out of this interaction of ideas. And I, unfortunately, Google Docs is very, it's a difficult place to have that natural emergence occur. Um, and like you said, we would try to do this in the comments and then we would find ourselves going down an entirely different but related idea. And you just it's hard to, like you said, it just forces you to think linearly when that's not really how thinking works necessarily, or at least when you're, when you're touching on new ideas. Uh, so I, I, I totally felt that bottleneck as well. And um, yeah, you're just kind of trying to, you know, fit a square peg into a round hole. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a, a really good picture. Um, you know, it, it, when I was writing, um, or, or, or rather I was kind of reading comments that you had made, and then that would spark a thought. And it, it was kind of related, but it, it didn't really slot into the structure that we had. And it wasn't about creating a new structure either. It's not like, um, I felt like this, uh, there wasn't anything inherently wrong with the structure. It's just that this was the format that Google Docs gave us to work with. And so I didn't have a place where I could like dump that new idea that may or may not be relevant, um, which is currently unrelated um, in any strong way to any of the concepts that we were exploring. Um, but I felt like it needed to be captured somewhere. And, and so that's why I was just dumping these comments in. And then we started having conversations around the comments. And then you kind of copy and pasting from the comments into the body text of the Google Doc. And um, I kind of really thought, um, you know, Google Docs seems to be great for, well, we, we both have a lot of experience with using Google Docs, and we both know that it works really well for collaborative writing. But I feel like it works really well in situations where you already have a good sense of the general direction that you want your argument to take. So you, you, you know your beginning, your middle, your end. And, and the kind of thinking that we were trying to do together to get at the essence of this new idea w that we wanted to explore in the paper, um, it, it really felt like um, the, uh, the Google Doc was, um, I think a bottleneck is also a good description of, of what we were trying to experience, trying to force these ideas into this linear structure, and it, it really didn't seem to be working very well. Is there anything else that you want to... Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, didn't you think that it felt a little chaotic yeah. in a way. Um, and, and that's actually a really good thing. I think you want, especially in the beginning, for things to be chaotic because these ideas bump into each other and you don't know what's going to come about when uh, two ideas merge or um, you know areas of evidence. Uh, and, and yeah, that's where that bottleneck just kind of limits the chaos. Uh, you can't really have much chaos in a Google Doc because you get lost pretty quickly. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. And it, it, it seems unusual to, uh, to suggest this, but you know, we were really looking for a way that we could um, uh, expand the chaos, increase the chaos, um, and, and look for those kind of new sparks, those new um, like ideas that were emerging from just you know, random bumping into other ideas. Um, and, and yeah, you're right, the, the, the Google Doc, it enforces structure because it's this paper-based thing and we, you know, it's top to bottom, left to right. And um, we had both uh, been working with Obsidian for, um, well, for, for myself coming up to maybe a year and a, a bit. Um, and you had also started using it relatively um, recently. Um, and I, I think, the, I, I, for, I forget who suggested it, but um, it, it kind of felt like the, the way that we had both been using Obsidian for our um, personal notes or professional notes, but you know, for personal learning, it it sounded like there was a, um, a, a not a flavor, a um, 
there was a format in Obsidian that made it feel like it might be a more suitable model for the kinds of thinking that we were trying to do together. Does, does that kind of capture a little bit about what we were talking about? I, I think you hit the nail on the head. And you described it really well recently. You, you, there's a lot of serendipity with Obsidian. You, even when I'm in my own notes, I will bump into things that I forgot I wrote that will spark a whole new area of inquiry and, um, and thought. And I noticed having another person in the Obsidian was an entirely new level because you have your own experiences and knowledge base and essentially you're bringing all of that to the table now with mine and it's, it's, it's much, like you said, it's much more chaotic um, but the amount of uh, like idea collisions that are still happening. Um, I, I don't know, wouldn't you agree? It's, it's pretty fun. Uh, it's almost like it's getting more chaotic, the more. Yeah, yeah, out. yeah. And I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about moving from this more chaotic structure to something that's a little bit more uh, structured and linear um, as, as it will need to be when we eventually do um, uh, capture this on a, um, a, a Word document. Um, but yeah, that's exactly right. Um, we, you know, started by uh, maybe, maybe just I'll, I'll just very quickly say what Obsidian is. Um, so you know, when you start Obsidian, uh, you're not going to have any of these notes on the left hand side. Uh, you just get a, a blank page, and you can create a new file, open file, and, and go to recent files. I've set this up uh, in in my Vault, and Obsidian Vault is really just a folder. Um, there's some basic plugins over here on the left. Um, and a, a graph, a local graph over here, which I'll, um, I'll show that a little bit. And the idea is that you, you really just start taking notes, but what really makes Obsidian quite powerful is the, the wiki link that allows you to make, create relationships between notes. And so it, it looks a little bit unstructured. It, it is meant to be unstructured. You can sort this in, in different ways. I normally modify it um, or it's, it's, it's sorted by the time that the file was modified, but you can have different um, different filtering and, and sorting there. Um, and uh, oh, I'll, I'll edit this out. I'm, I'm a little bit um, all over the place. Um, and uh, you'll see that as you move through the notes, different things changes. So there are backlinks in Obsidian. We don't need to get into that um, at the moment, but you know, as you get more and more notes and you're looking to create relationships, um, these backlinks can be quite powerful. And then the other thing that's worth looking at is this uh, local graph in the bottom right. And so what's really nice is that you start seeing um, relationships between notes that you didn't necessarily think were there. Um, and maybe just to demonstrate that, uh, we'll ha have a look at the, the, the whole graph. Um, and you already start seeing these points of interest where the, the size of the, uh, the node in the graph is uh, quite a bit bigger. Um, you also start noticing that there are some of these ideas that are disconnected from other ideas. Uh, there's, there's nothing, um, there's no edges linking it to another node. So if we look at this node, we can see that uh, it's called prediction error minimization and it's linked to quite a few other nodes. If I click on that, it'll open that note and open your, the, the local graph on the bottom right uh, where you can start getting a sense of what that looks like and what other notes it's connected to. So um, I think if we're looking at a way to capture new ideas um, without forcing you to figure out where that idea fits, um, I think that was uh, very, very valuable for me. Um, so starting off with the Google Doc, uh, both you and I over the last week or so, maybe a little bit longer, we've started moving uh, individual concepts into separate notes in um, in this Obsidian Vault. I don't know, Ben. Do you want to say anything about just kind of the the beginning phase of you know what it was like for you to start working in in this kind of environment? Yeah, I think it just forced me to put all of my effort into learning the relationships between different uh, concepts, ideas. You know, these all these atomic notes. I think that's what they call them. Uh, you know, they're, they're short. Uh, they have one main point. But when you begin to connect that to other ideas, and you start creating that graph, I found that to be pretty powerful because you no longer are 
you know, limited by this format, you know, created by Google or, or unintentionally created by Google. Um, it's just, it just allows you to make connections a lot easier and the speed of the actual program is another awesome feature, I think, uh, you know, I don't know, did you find that it was a lot faster than, than Google Docs? I, I, I found I could just whiz through um, a bunch of notes uh, really quickly or different areas of our thought process and that type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think the speed of Obsidian, because you're working with these local text files, uh, is is really, really powerful. And, and I, you know, we, I don't often find people talking about this, but I, I just find that the UI is uh, delightful. Um, I think the, the the font the font family um, or the typeface rather is is beautiful, um, so it's it's nice to read. It's nice to type. It's really responsive, um, and I, I just find it it yeah a delight to to work in. Um, and the other thing that is is really nice is this um, the fact that we are using Dropbox to synchronize the notes, and so it's it's all free. We're not paying for Obsidian Sync, and what's so amazing is that every time I come back to the vault, I can see because it's organized by whatever was modified um, most recently, um, I can see which files you've changed. And so I come in and, you know, I just start at the top and I start working down and I can immediately start seeing what it is that you've added um, over the last day or two. And in reading your notes, um, I, I start editing your notes, um, you know, with, with, I start adding content uh, with new ideas that are being sparked by reading what you've been writing. Um, and uh, it, it's just uh, such a creative, interesting, um, yeah, serendipitous way of uh, thinking together. Um, it's kind of this structured serendipity. It's not like completely random, um, but it still allows for this uh, kind of bouncing around of ideas um, without feeling like you have to force it into a structure. Right, and that structure emerges naturally over time, uh, and I guess we can talk about that because that's that's it. Still has tools to allow you to structure it in a way uh, that is that needs to be written in a, you know like a paper format. Um, so there, there's just it can do almost everything. I, I hate to say that, but uh, it really can yeah. almost do everything. Yeah, I'm gonna just just as a as a way of um, showing. You know how this really stimulates creative thinking. Um, if what I'm, I'm looking at it in the editing mode now, you can see these are the wiki links that I'm, I'm highlighting here. Um, and if we go into edit mode and I mouse over these links, you can see you can read the notes that um, this is linking to. So uh, if if I if I'm reading through this and I want to see what these common errors are, um, I can scroll through that and and read those. Um, so it, it really is a really powerful way to, to work together. Um, and, uh, you, you know, there are other things like you can add um, highlighting. So there, this little bit of text is now highlighted. Um, so if there's something that I really want to bring to your attention, I can highlight it or, or just kind of um, remind myself a little bit later. Uh, let me just get rid of that. Are there other features that you think make this program just special? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, the, the fact that it basically is converting plain text into HTML, I think that that really is what the most one of the most powerful things. So there was something that I added, um, I thought it would be useful for us to look at, um, you know, what clinical reasoning frameworks currently exist. So this is something that came out of a textbook, it's, it's relatively old, and I don't, I didn't add it here because I thought it was particularly good. Um, but I added it here because I thought, you know, how trivial is it to I'll delete it now, so you can see that picture is no longer there. But you're in media. Um, I want the clinical reasoning framework with patient input, and I just drag that in here, and you know, now your note has has this image in it. Um, anyway, I think I think it's really powerful that you can add images, you can add external links, um, but you're still only ever working with text, and so it's it's really fast, really responsive. Um, and, and for me, I, I find that to be very powerful. And the output is also quite beautiful. Um, like, it's just like you, you enjoy using it, right? You yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, so we were you, you were talking about um, giving it structure. Um, what what did you what did you mean by that? So you you still need a, a more formal structure when so it's it's all very well that we've got this collection of notes that's expanding and we're we're adding ideas and it's all very exciting. But at some point we need to collect all of these ideas and put them into some kind of internally consistent, coherent narrative that other people are going to understand. Uh, what were you talking about? I think I was trying to get towards this idea of transclusion. Yeah. That uh, I, I'm actually quite new to. So I think when I, when I realized we can do that, it's like, okay, we can do everything that a Google Doc can do, except we can have it within this pretty powerful way of connecting ideas and thinking, that type of thing. Yeah. No, so that's 100% right. So I've created a, a new note called Outline of the Article. Um, actually, b before I get into that, um, I think maybe I'll also just say one of the other benefits of using Obsidian is that all of your notes are stored locally in plain text files. So if we look at the, the file structure um, in my, um, uh, on, on my computer, so here is this AI and PT uh, folder. Here are all of the notes that we've just been looking at. This is the new one that I've just created um, called Outline of the Article. And if we open that in plain text, uh, you can see here it is. If I write test in, uh, in this document, then there it shows up test in Obsidian. So you're really not restricted to using Obsidian. You can edit your text in, um, in any text editor on any device. So you can use your phone, your tablet, uh, you can use Dropbox to synchronize those text files across multiple devices. So even though it's kind of got this really nice uh, wiki linking feature where you've got backlinks, uh, you've got transclusion, which we'll explain now, you've got links to external sources, it's all still plain text. And plain text is something that's going to be editable on any device you know, for the next 100 years. Um, there isn't a single device that can't edit plain text or, or can't at least can't display it. Um, so I think that's also a really powerful feature. You're never going to be locked into Obsidian. You can always migrate your notes into something else if you decide at some point that Obsidian isn't what's, uh, uh, what you want to use anymore. So yeah. Um, I think that the idea that you've got a local folder structure with all of your documents stored in plain text is is really powerful. Um, so you mentioned transclusion, and uh, transclusion is really just an idea from computer science where uh, you can pull in um, uh, content from one document into another document. And the way that you do transclusion in Obsidian is you just add a um, exclamation mark, and now we. I mean, I'm just going to randomly um, add some documents here. And we'll just do one more. So you can see that using this kind of structure, a general structure for an article, you can see that we can start pulling in ideas into some kind of coherent narrative. And uh, this will be the kind of high level argument that we follow uh, to, to answer the question or to resolve the problem that we're trying to address with this article. And if you look at this in the preview mode, you can see that it actually pulls every single note into uh, one long narrative. And we don't really have a lot of uh, citation in these, in these notes, but you can see that each note has a space for a reference. So the idea is that you would have these very short, concise, atomic concepts, and each of those concepts would be explained um, in, some, in some depth. You can see this note is actually quite long. We might want to start thinking about splitting out this note into a few, a few smaller notes. It's got relationships to other notes that might be worth thinking about connecting to when we're writing the narrative. And each separate concept will have its own citation. And so eventually, once we have experimented and we think we have enough concepts to help us answer the question that we want to deal with, uh, we can start playing around with putting those arguments into a narrative. And you can decide that if, if that doesn't really fit 
fit there. And maybe that comes more later. You can just swap these arguments around um, into a structure that uh, makes sense for you. And by reading these, um, the, the, the note titles, you should be able to follow a general outline of, uh, of the article without needing to move it somewhere else. And then as you move into this preview mode, you can start looking at it in more depth and start seeing whether or not your argument actually makes sense using these uh, individual notes. And then once you've, once you've got it into this format, you can pull it all out and uh, move it into a, a Word document. And now you've had this opportunity where you've been able to explore all of these notes in, um, in, in a lot of depth. Uh, you didn't need to go into it knowing necessarily the direction, the structure, the depth um, that you wanted to take. You had free reign to, to explore ideas more or less randomly, um, but you still get to a point where you can uh, put those ideas into some kind of um, internally consistent narrative, um, which can then become a first draft of an article. Um, yeah, what, what, now I've, I've kind of explained what, what it is and how you do it. Um, do you have any, any thoughts on that, Ben? Um, nothing that new to add. I think it's just nice because basically now you have the functionality of any other, you know, Word doc or uh, Google doc. And uh, yeah, it's just pretty powerful, especially when I like how they did the UI. Like you can, if there's scrolling features on one page, that gets embedded in that outline, uh, and you know you can you can hover over links like it's just you can pretty much put everything on one page at, at one point uh, if you really to to really create a nice cohesive argument or whatever you're trying to do. So yeah, pretty cool feature. Yeah, and I, I'm wondering, can you? Yeah, so I mean, I didn't even know this, but I mean, check it out. We can um, you can pull you can pull notes from your from your uh, index on the left, you can pull it into your into your document, and then to make it uh, transcluded notes, you just add the. So you can you can go through this index on the left, and you can pull pull notes into your argument as you need them. Um, I mean, this is this is really great. I didn't realize that you could do this. So if if in this argument we now decide that we want to at this point. It's a good point to talk about the social determinants of health. I can just pull that note into the argument at that point, uh, which is which is pretty great. So you can you can build your argument over time. But uh, I have to say, for for me, I mean, this is great. But w what's really been the most valuable for me is being able to kind of not quite get into your head, but to see how what I've said has. Um, has stimulated some of your thinking and how some of your thinking has then led me to go down different kind of uh, you know rabbit holes and, and different ways of thinking. Um, it's been, uh, you, you commented before we started recording on some of the work that I'd done this morning. And that was really just because I, I went in, I knew because you know Dropbox says, you know Ben's made some changes to, to the folder, so I went to go have a look. And I just got really, um, stimulated by some of the, the the notes that you had made and so that just kind of pushed me to to keep going and to keep thinking and make new notes new thoughts and uh, it was it was such a i felt like it was such a creative pleasant fun experience which is not something i can really say uh, has been true for most of the writing that that i've ever done what why we've kind of gone over this but why because i feel the same way what what is it about Obsidian that does that? <laughs> that makes that possible? I think well I, I think the fact that you're encouraged to create notes separately and randomly and not have to force it into a narrative, I think that's something that I've enjoyed whether I'm I've been working with you or with uh, you know just my own personal notes. Um, I love the fact that I can just, you know, control N, create a new note and and write this idea down, um, which isn't something that I feel like I've been able to do with many other um, note taking apps, especially given the fact that I can then connect that note into my knowledge graph. So I can I can relate it to other ideas. You know, if you've got these notes that sit by themselves, 
you forget about them pretty quickly. So I think that is something that is really, really uh, valuable for me. And I have to say, like uh, the UI, uh, the, the user interface, I can't think of a, a better word than delightful. Like I really, yeah, I really enjoy spending time in, in Obsidian. Um, and, it, you know, that's not something you can say about Word. Um, yeah. Yeah, because, the you know, the entirety of your thinking on a certain topic or if you have a vault that has everything, uh, it's right in front of you, essentially. And so it's it just entices you to put more stuff in there and, um, and make connections and think about the connections, too. Yeah. Uh, I just can't think of many programs that help with that. I mean, this is a thinking tool. It's not so much a note-taking tool. It is good for notes. Yeah. But this yeah. is really about thinking. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I can't think of another program that does does that quite like this one. Well, I mean, I, I know that there are two others that spring to mind immediately are um, LogSeq, which uh, is an open source version of Rome Research. And Rome Research is, uh, it's very similar to, to Obsidian. It, it does a lot of this, the same kinds of things. Um, but you, you pay for it. It's $15 a month, uh, which I think is uh, incredibly expensive uh, for what you get. Um, it's, it's basically like I think of it as a glorified outliner. So, yeah, there are other tools that I think th this idea of, uh, you know, a second brain um, of, you know, linking your thinking, you, that's this uh, personal knowledge management. Um, you're seeing a lot more of this coming out. Um, if you just go do a search on YouTube, you'll or, or in Google, look at Google Trends, you'll see that the, this has been increasing over the last couple of years. Um, but I, I haven't found anything else that I've enjoyed using as much as Obsidian, especially around the linking. Um, the, the, the internal linking between notes, I think, is incredibly powerful. And I have to say, this experiment where we've been using Dropbox to uh, work on ideas together, um, kind of thinking together, uh, I think has been just really powerful. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to carrying on um, if, for this article. But I can think of so many other really, really powerful uses for this kind of shared thinking, collaborative thinking, um, which, uh, yeah, again, I'm, I'm not really familiar of, of anything else, with anything else that uh, gives you the same functionality. What do you think are some second order impacts here of a lot of people starting to use this? And we can even say specifically within, you know, physiotherapy. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine having a, a shared uh, Dropbox for a particular um, domain within physiotherapy uh, where you, you can invite people who are, you know, I don't want to say world leaders, but, you know, experts in that particular domain. You, you can imagine a teacher with a, a classroom. Um, you know, I think anywhere where you don't have a really strong intuition about what the right answer is. Um, I think this is a really powerful tool for experimenting and seeing, to, you can actually see how ideas get, get sparked and um, you know, new ideas get created. Uh, and, and I can imagine then, like I'm, I'm obviously I spend a lot of time in, in the classroom, I'm a teacher. Uh, I'd love to use something like this as an assignment with students. And then to pull what we're seeing in the graph back into the classroom. So have the have the conversation in the classroom informed by, uh, you know, what what we're seeing um, in terms of how the graph the graph is changing. Uh, you know, that's something that that uh, I haven't thought about until you asked. But you know, now that you mention it, I think that could be quite powerful. What about you? Yeah, that's what I was. That was that's what I was thinking about too. Is yeah, I just graduated, and I think one of the biggest challenges in school is learning the what in combination with why does this matter um, because I think there's unintentionally it's not just PT school it is schools in general they just cater more towards downloading information versus understanding why it matters and connecting it um, amongst other you know the existing knowledge base um, and we don't really have any tools for, for that other than just having phenomenal professors who really push you to, uh, to think this way and, and think about how this relates to what we've learned. Um, and I think that's what differentiates grad school from um, my undergrad experiences is my professors just pushed us to think in terms of relationships more. And this is 
I couldn't think of a better tool uh, to stimulate that and kind of create my own relationships too, right? Like it's it's not led by a professor, um, especially when you do it on your own. That that's a lot more powerful. Uh, yeah. So that, that's just my thoughts there. It would have been so helpful in school. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if I think back to my undergrad, which was a, l a little bit longer ago, um, but uh, this would have been fantastic. I, I've got, you know, handwritten notes, but also just, you know, Word documents, so many Word documents. And it's you, you can't create relationships between those concepts in, in different Word documents. And the alternative is to put them all into a single document. So now you can you can uh, use anchors and bookmarks to, to jump around uh, to create those internal references. Um, but man, is it painful. Whereas this is just, uh, it's as easy as creating these wiki links. Uh, this has been really, really enjoyable. And I, th I feel like that's huge. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, well, I think on that note, um, it's probably a good point to, uh, to close things off. Um, is, is there anything else that you think is worth mentioning? Um, I think this is a relatively slow, I mean, not slow, a relatively small learning curve. And I would... I would recommend people try it out. I think this is a powerful, powerful tool. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, we, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about how to install this, how to, uh, you know, create a new vault, how to use Dropbox to synchronize the files. Um, and, you know, th that wasn't really the purpose of the video. Um, but I, I think maybe it might be worth doing another video to to talk about some of those ideas. But to be honest, you know, if, if you go to YouTube and you search, you know, how to set up Obsidian, how to use Dropbox with Obsidian, uh, you're going to find more than enough information to, to help you get to that point. And once it's installed, it's really as trivial as, as starting to write. Yeah, and, and the fact that it's local to your hard, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of like, you know, account creation and it yeah. just, it just exists on your computer. There's no, there's no server you're interacting with. It's an immediate uh, an immediate experience. Yeah. So. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks so much, Ben. I really appreciate it. Um, I think I think it's been good uh, to to talk through the process that we went through and the the problems that we think that Obsidian helps us to resolve when when writing and and I, and I think especially the kind of writing where we're doing where we started without really having a good sense of where we were going. It's not like we had a very clear question. It was just in conversation, these, these concepts kept coming up and, um, you know, trying to think, you know, feeling like there's something here um, without really knowing what it was. I think this has been such a, a useful experience. And you know what, even if nothing, even if there is no paper that comes from this, um, I feel like uh, this is, uh, it's been a very powerful, very creative, very stimulating way to re reflect together, to think together, um, to, to share our thinking. And uh, yeah, um, I, I think it will have had value, even if there is no paper that comes from it. I agree. Thanks for having me, Michael. I mean, I, I wouldn't um, have discovered this tool if it weren't for your videos and your exploration of this. And I agree. I, I, I think this is going to change how we do research in the future, honestly. I think it's going to change how we do writing. I think it's going to change how we do learning. Um, is it going to be Obsidian itself? I don't know, but I think the concept, this is pretty novel. Um, this way, we're, we're leveraging um, a, a brilliant software, um, and it's relatively simple, uh, to, to do something that's very difficult to do, which is to link all of our thinking and, um, and yeah, create those moments where it's easier to interact with other people's ideas and experiences and evidence um, I think there's a lot, a lot to be had there. So very excited to continue uh, working on this with you, and, and excited for other people to join too. I love the community um, I've learned in Obsidian. It's it, people are very passionate about this because I think, I think it's tough to put into words, but very excited. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Ben. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll chat soon.